Man, what a day, what a day. We, we're in a sermon series. Uh, today is part two of a sermon series called What on Earth Am I Here For? Why don't you turn your neighbor and give him a fist bump and just let him know you're glad to be in church. Glad to be in church. Glad to be here today. You guys are looking good. Dallas Willard said, the New Testament is a book by disciples, for disciples, about disciples. <clears throat> this week, I, I had the pleasure of walking up to a building. And there was a nice reflection on the window, and I did one of these. Have you ever done this before where you see yourself, and you're like, pause. You have to straighten stuff out, <clears throat> check stuff out, right? And only to realize when you go inside, there were people on the other side looking out. <clears throat> Nothing worse. So as we go to the scripture, just remember that the word of God is a window that we can see God's nature, his heart, but it's also a mirror that we get to see who and what we are. <clears throat> and my prayer is that today the Lord will, through the Holy Spirit, allow you to see a little bit more of yourself, the good, the bad, the ugly, but also the redeemed, the design, the glory that is living <clears throat> inside of you. The Bible is the only book where the author actually shows up when you read it. So we're gonna read the scriptures today. We're gonna ask the Holy Spirit just to speak to us and instruct us. So Ephesians 1 and 11 <clears throat> says this. It's in Christ that we find out who we are and what we're living for. That's called a meta claim. Who we are and why we are are both found in the same place, in Christ. In Christ, we find out who and why we are. Long before we first heard of Christ and got our hopes up, he had his eye on us. He designed, uh, excuse me, had designs on us for glorious living, part of the overall purpose. Everybody say purpose. purpose. One more time, purpose. purpose. One more time, that was like 47%. One more time. Purpose. I didn't do the hand, I didn't do the hand. Let's do it again. Purpose, purpose. There, I love it, that's amazing, good job. <laughs> part of the overall purpose he is working out in everything and everyone. Ephesians 2 and 10 says this, for we are God's masterpiece. He has created us anew in Christ Jesus so we can do the good things that he has planned for us long ago. So you're a masterpiece. You may be a mess, but you're still a masterpiece. Colossians 1 and 15 says this, we look at this son, not S-U-N, but the S-O-N, the son, the son of the living God, and see the God who cannot be seen. We look at this son and see God's original purpose in everything created. <clears throat> For everything, absolutely everything, above and below, visible, invisible, rank after rank after rank of angels, everything got started in him and finds its purpose in him. He was there before any of it came into existence and holds it all together right up to this moment. And when it comes to the church, he organized, everybody say organize, and holds it together like a head does the body. I know some people don't like um, organized religion. I tell people all the time, come to the Promise Center. We're not super organized. Uh, but <laughs> I, think, I think God does organize. I think he is organizing. I think that God has a purpose, has a plan. And uh, we find all this in Jesus. Heavenly Father, I thank you for your word. I thank you for everyone who's in this room and online watching. I pray that you would just animate your word, animate your will today. Anoint us all, let us hear, receive, and be changed in Jesus' name. And everybody say, amen, amen. amen. Now, my wife is not here, so I get to talk about this a little bit. I'm working through some, some stuff. I wanna work through a problem with you guys. Um, I have a picture, I have a picture that I wanna put up here. It's a picture of a brownie that was eaten. And here's all I want. By a show of hands, does this make sense to anybody? Does this feel right? This is right. Now, to the rest of you, I don't want to know your opinion. How many here does this feel wrong? This feels wrong. This is wrong. Now, this is what I tell Heidi. I said, there's, well, before I get to my reason, let me tell you, Heidi and I, I, I married my complete opposite, right? Um, you know, I, I, we got introduced to house shoes. Someone bought us house shoes uh, a couple Christmases ago. And like, I will not, if I get to the door, the house shoes come off, I go barefoot, right? Heidi wears her house shoes out to get the mail and out to, and I'm like, 
they're no longer house shoes, they're just shoes. They're just shoes now, they're no longer house shoes. Right, we, we are, does anybody agree with that? That makes sense, that feel right? Heidi, Heidi loves like the sheets tucked tight at the end of the bed where your toes can't point up. So I walk like, I, like you, if I walk funny, it's because of the sheets that are tucked. So I'm pulling them out, she's tucking them in. Anyways, we're complete opposites. I don't, I don't know where my brownie is. My brownie needs to come back. Okay, there's my brownie. So here, here's the, I tell my wife, there's a reason. I can eat this piece and get to the middle, or you can just give me the middle. And I'm doing this for you, babe, because I don't want to eat two pieces. I just want to eat one giant piece from the middle. Anyways, we still haven't figured it all out, but God's helping us. The point is today, if there is a point connected with this, and I think I thank all the hands that went up that, that agree with me. There, it's not a crime to eat out of the middle. Anyways, long story short, there, there, there's, a, there's, a, there's a reason, there's, a, there's, a, there's, a, there's a, a method to the madness. And new studies are finding that we are living, you can take the pic, yeah. Um, we're, we're getting hungry watching that, okay. Um, new studies show us that we're living in what they're calling a zombie generation. That like never before, people don't feel purpose don't have meaning, like there's, there's like this sense of like disconnectedness, even though we're like hyper-connected on social media. And here's what's happening. There's what they're calling aimlessness. There's no like purpose and meaning that's guiding, like a North Star that guides our life. And I wanna say this, that aimlessness is dangerous. Aimlessness is not painless. It's painful. Everyone is going to end up somewhere in life. And I believe God wants us to end up somewhere on purpose. Not putting our life in neutral. Not living based on pleasure. In fact, it was Chris Hodges who says, you can't fix pain with pleasure. You fix pain with purpose. Purpose just elevates your life. When you live for a reason, when you wake up and there's, a, there's an existential meaning deep inside, that you know makes a difference, not just in the temporal world, but eternally. It just, it's a different gear that we were all made to have and to live by. And if you don't have that, and you're just living for the weekend, living for Friday. I know people who just live for Friday. Friday's coming, man. Well, then it's Saturday morning, and they've, they're hungover, and they're hurting. And then they're like, well, we got Saturday night, and, 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 and just li- living for stuff that just fades away. Alice in Wonderland, Lewis Carroll's Alice in Wonderland, the, the Cheshire Cat, many of you have heard this before, said this, if you don't know where you're going, any road will take you there. Any road will take you there. I read a book several years ago, some of you did too, I know. Um, it's called Good to Great by Jim Collins. And he said, the opening of his book, good is the enemy of great. And that is one of the key reasons why we have so few, so few that become great. We don't have great schools principally because we have good schools. We don't have great government principally because we have good government. Or maybe it's marriages or ministries or whatever it may be. It's easy to get lax. It's easy as a generation to get lax. Like, it's all good. Like, like I'm ordering, you know, something from the other side of the United States and it's gonna be here in 24 hours according to my Prime account, right? Like things have gotten easy and cushy and what ends up happening if we're not careful, pleasures fight against purpose. Comfort fights against purpose. And my heart for you is for you to live a life that's elevated by purpose. If you have a pulse, you have a purpose. Amen? If you have a pulse, if you're living today, if you're alive today, if you're in this room breathing today, there's a purpose and a meaning for your life. We talked about this last week, finding our purpose, our meaning, and then our validation in the Lord. Um, There's a a video that I'm going to recommend that you watch later after the Warriors win today in Jesus' name, um, you can watch on YouTube, Curtis Martin, Hall of Fame um, induction. He gives a speech. And in this speech, he says something at the onset that you would think, this is like the worst thing to say as you're being honored and inducted into the NFL Hall of Fame. He says, I don't like football. He says, I've never liked football. 
He says, I, you can, I, I can count on one hand how many times I've actually watched a football game. This is a man who's being inducted to the Hall of Fame. You know, you think like he's passionate about it. He goes, I'm a running back. He goes, I don't even like running. I was like, I like this guy already. I like this guy already. But he, he grew up in a very hard uh, situation growing up, became a Christian, had a passion for people, passion for ministry, passion to make a difference in lives. And he gets a, a call by Bill Parcells asking if he wanted to be a patriot. He gets a phone call at home and his family's with him and some, some extended family. And then even his pastor was there and he, and he said, yes, yes, I, I do. And he hangs up the phone and with like tears in his eyes, looks at his family and goes, I don't wanna play football, I hate football. I don't like football. And his family and the pastor stood up and said, hey, like, you may not like football, but this could be a platform that allows you to make a difference. And so this is what he said. I played hard. I worked hard, not because I love football, but because I was about serving Jesus and serving people. And that's how I got better. It was a bigger purpose. He, he said, I, he, and these are exact words, and I quote, I played for a purpose that was bigger than the game itself. There's an old saying, when you're bigger than your purpose, you have a career. But when your purpose is bigger than you, you have a calling. And there's a difference between the two. The old saying, the bottom line is profit, but it's not purpose. It's not purpose. The story of Joshua, who stands and he, he's looking at the people and he says, Choose ye this day whom you will serve. He made this, he, 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 this, this declaration and this call to action. He did not say, choose ye this day if you will serve. He said, choose ye this day whom you will serve. Why? Because we all serve something. We're all dedicated to something. We're all invested in something. It may be money, it may be Comfort, it may be people, it may be pleasure, maybe any kinds of thing. But let me tell you, if you don't have a purpose that's bigger than you, higher than you, purpose helps you determine priorities in life. When you know your purpose, you can now set your priorities straight. When you have purpose, purpose allows you to be able to go through pain that you would normally not go through. Because if pain has a purpose and meaning, you can endure it. It's when someone loses their purpose, then the pain becomes unbearable. Purpose exposes waste, wickedness. Purpose keeps your compass clean. It gives you clear direction. We need purpose. Jesus said this, remember this? He said, if the salt loses its saltiness, it just falls to the ground and gets trampled on, right? It, it, if if the salt loses the reason it's salty, which is to be salty, like you would think like salt being salty is not, it's not a nonsensical uh, ask. Can you please salt be salty? But if it loses the very reason it exists, he says, then it just falls to the ground and it loses meaning. And this is what people, this is what the world is longing for and don't realize it can be found in the God that made them because there's design, there's wonder in who you are. In fact, this is why we at the Promise Center exist. We want people to know God. We want you to have a true, authentic relationship with God. We want you to find freedom. We want you to walk in victory and freedom in Jesus. And then we also want you to find and discover your purpose. In fact, everything we do here at the Promise Center, there's a reason for it. We wanna live on purpose. In fact, we even call our lobby, we don't call it a lobby, we call it a, a connect center. Because the purpose of the lobby isn't so people can lob. <laughs> the purpose of the lobby is for people to connect. So we call it a connect center. We want you to connect with each other. We want you to connect with next steps. We want you to connect into a group. We want you to have transformation on not just transaction, but transformational conversations and relationships and all of that. So we call it a connect center. Amen. Um, we, we also do things like, like FPU, Financial Peace University. You know, if you want peace in your finances, peace really comes through having what? Purpose in your finances. Seeing a vision for your life. Every dollar has an assignment. There's a purpose connected to why you're, if you don't have a purpose, you don't have a goal, if you don't see the future that the, that the Holy Spirit is inspired, then it's easy to be aimless about every part of your life. Amen? 
And so what we do here is we try to be purposeful in ministry, purposeful in deliverance. This weekend, we had freedom, as Charity spoke about, and as, as my son spoke about, and many of you are still speaking about, the, the afterglow of the freedom. How many enjoyed the Freedom Conference? <laughs> Amen. But, but it, it, the Freedom Conference wasn't come and just, we're gonna shoot you with the water hose and, and just spray and pray and hope something happens. But it was very, it was very like, we're gonna deal with rejection. We're gonna deal with purity and shame and abuse and anger and fear. We're gonna deal with the things that grip people's heart and oppress people from being able to express and walk in the true victory that Jesus outlined for them and promised them through the victory over death, hell, and the grave. In fact, Jesus lived a life on purpose. When he was 12 years old and his parents were looking for him, he goes, don't you know I'm gonna be at my, my father's business, like I'm here on purpose. Whenever Jesus went public with baptism, he didn't go public with his faith like we do. Like Jesus never had like a, a moment of like, oh my goodness, I, I believe I should get baptized. I need to repent, I, I'm, I'm, I'm a sinner. He was not a sinner, he was, holy. He, was, he was the holy one. He is the righteous one. He is the righteousness of God, et cetera, et cetera. And so he didn't do it to go public with his faith. He, went, he did it to go public with his purpose. That's who he is. This is what he does, amen? Uh, he said, for this reason has the Son of Man come into the world. Why? To die. Tear down this body in three days I'll raise it up. You want a sign, that's the sign. That, that's it. You, it's not the miracles, it's not the cool things that I'm doing, it's not the cool teachings. This is the sign. For this reason have I come into the world. He knew his purpose. And when you have a purpose, it, 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 it pushes everything that's not connected with that purpose out. And this is what we need. We need the spirit of Jesus that is so specific and so full of heart and passion connected to destiny and design and why I am here on this earth planet. And whenever you walk in purpose now, it, through the life of Jesus, we see that every conversation was significant. Every dinner with sinners was si significant. Every smile and conversation, every cup that we give in his name is significant. He said, you will not lose your reward, et cetera, et cetera. And let me say this, the devil will fight you at the level of your calling. This is where the enemy, he did this with Jesus. He said, if you are the son of God, if you are the son of God, the devil is afraid of the children of God, knowing they are the children of God, knowing that they are kings and priests called to reign, called to walk in victory. If you just say, well, it's always gonna be this way. Oh, just, you know what? This, I'm just gonna always have to deal with this thing. You don't have to deal with this thing. There's a victory in Christ that you can find. Why? Because I have access to the entire kingdom. The entire kingdom is his, and he says, whatever's mine is yours. Why don't we access it? I gotta keep moving on, but I'm telling you, somebody here today, God wants to emancipate you, put you into your identity and your purpose, amen? amen. Now, let, let, me, let me say this. There's a lot to be said, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna hurry along. Um, we are unique. One of the things I love about the Promise Center is, is, is like the diversity of this church in age, in background. There's people that are here today who, you know, a, a year ago had never even opened a Bible. Never, there's people who have come to church who have never even been in a church before. Can you imagine that? Like, did you ever go to a wedding? Yeah, it was outside. Did you ever go to a funeral? Yeah, it was like at, uh, like a, you know, it was a, a graveside thing. You've never been in a church, never been in a church. There, there's people of all backgrounds. In fact, I saw a Laker jersey the other day and I was like. <laughs> Even you are welcome here. <laughs> you're gonna split hell wide open, but you're welcome here, okay? <sighs> now to prove this to you, and if you're a Laker fan, we love you. We have a prayer team that'll be here at the end of the <laughs> service. Um, okay, to, to prove this to you, let me show you this little, little uh, diagram here. We're gonna, we got four, okay, here we go. So in this room are not just all of the, the spectrum of life and experiences, but, but even like appetite. Like how many, how many here, of all the French fries on this, on this uh, screen, how many would say McDonald's is their favorite? How many McDonald's is their favorite? Yeah. You, your hands went up real slow, all the chemicals. It was like, I can't get my hand up. I'm so tired, so tired. Okay, all right, we know who you are. There's a handful. All right, um, how about in and out Any in and out people? See, now we got cheers going on. I like that, all right? How about five guys with a little, little sauce, little spice? Yeah, boo. Oh, wow, okay, all right. We got booze. I didn't, we didn't get that in the first one. How about Chick-fil-A? Chick-fil-A waffle fries. Hey, that's Christian chicken right there. I think, I think, I think Chick-fil-A wins. I think Chick-fil-A wins. In fact, here's what I'm gonna do for you. Um, those of you who participated today, if you go to Chick-fil-A and you can find someone 
to serve you. I will take care of your, I'm just kidding. I'm kidding. That would be something. Don't try it. They're closed on Sundays. Okay. So, so watch this. Psalms 139, 13. Oh yes, you shaped me first inside, then out. Okay. I wish I had a lot more time. Who I am started with divine spiritual design. Like there's a design inside, the call, the meaning for, and so he's like, you know what, Chad's gonna be, you know, I I need him to have a good little swoop of hair. I'm gonna give him three calyx right up the front. So I don't know. I don't know how, why God designed it this way with the calyx, but he's like, hey, we're gonna need that right there to keep you humble, right? I don't know. I don't know why he did it, but whatever it is. You formed me in my mother's womb. I thank you, high God. You're breathtaking. Body and soul, I'm marvelously made. I worship in adoration. What a creation. You know me inside and out. You know every bone in my body. You know exactly how I was made, bit by bit, how I was sculpted from nothing into something. So if you ever wanna tell someone that you're sculpted, you can tell them right here. You have scripture to say that you have, you're sculpted. Um, like an open book, you watch me grow Uh, from conception to birth. All the stages of my life were spread out before you. The days of my life all prepared before I even lived one day. Like God's plan. God's plan from the very, very beginning. Amen. And and I I, I often ask why, why would we want to compare ourselves or try to be somebody else? You know, that whole grass is greener is on the other side. It's greener because it's astroturf. It's not even real, Okay. (laughs) Like, there's a, there's a, we don't need the cheap imitation version of you. We need the real, authentic masterpiece that God made. Now, I'm, I'm gonna go quickly and, and, and get into um, the, a book called Lynchpin by Seth Godin. I, I read this about three or four years ago, and he talks about the four industrial revolutions, uh, mechanization, which is mechanics, steam engine, Uh, which is 1765, the first industrial revolution. The second one is 1870, field of industries, electricity, fine-tuning machinery, assembly lines, steel demand. The third is 1969, which is the field of electronics and computers. And the fourth one is the current, it's internet, information, streaming, digital, all of that. Now, he talks about the pursuit of interchangeability. And I'm gonna try to be as quick as I can with this. But the, the idea of interchangeable parts, you and I, you know, if, if something breaks on something that we purchase, we can call the manufacturer and they can send a part. And that part can just, you take out an old part and, or a broken part and add a new one. Before 1765, everything was custom made. Everything. There were no, the idea of interchangeable parts was like so foreign. Um, when it came to, and, and the way that this kind of began was in 1765, a little uh, known French general said, hey, all of the guns, we're going to war, and a lot of war, Napoleonic Wars, all, all these wars happening in Europe at this time. We need guns that are, like if something breaks, can we, can we fix the trigger? Can we fix this bolt? And everything, because everything was custom made, nothing was interchangeable. And so long story short, Thomas Jefferson encountered the the general and started getting some ideas and he asked Eli Whitney, who was the inventor of the cotton gin, and he said, hey, we need to make guns with interchangeable parts, okay? Which leads to this next kind of push of the Industrial Revolution and this is what he says. He says this, Henry Ford changed all this. Henry Ford kind of took this interchangeable parts idea to the next level. He, he, he developed and promoted mass production for cars, he made huge quantities and he did it at very low cost. Capitalism had found its new holy grail. Within two years um, uh, of the launch, the Ford system, he called it, productivity expanded 400%. In essence, the mass production happened because of interchangeable parts. Time, space, men, motion, money, material, everything was made more efficient because every piece was predictable and separate. Ford's uh, discipline was to avoid short-term gains in exchange for always seeking the interchangeable and always standardizing. It only allows then that you, it only follows then that you eliminate the skilled worker, the finisher, the custom part maker, then you also save money on wages and can build a company that's easy to scale. In other words, first you have interchangeable parts, then you have interchangeable workers. 
By 1925, the die was cast. The goal was to hire the lowest skilled labor possible at the lowest possible wage. To do anything else was financial suicide. That's the labor market that we were trained for. So from everything is custom to nothing is custom. If everything is interchangeable, here's what he said at the end of this, then everything becomes disposable, even people. And this is the mindset that we have, that we are just a cog, that we are just a piece, and if God, you know, if, if I don't show up, then God will just replace you with somebody else. You are so uniquely made, you're custom made. The work of God is a custom work. It's a custom building. The Bible says that he is building a house. And how does he do it? With these lively stones. Well, what does that mean? Well, in Exodus chapter 20 and 25, it points back to this, this idea of the stone. If you use stones, this is what God says, watch this. To build my altar, use only natural uncut stones. Do not shape the stones with a tool, okay? Which means don't even, you can't make bricks. Don't shape the stones, that would make the altar unfit for holy use. What's the point? The point is this, that God wants to take all of the experiences. Every rock has a story to tell. It broke off of another rock. It was weathered. It, was, it has certain mineral deposits inside of it. God says, I want it that way. If you're gonna build me an altar, build it with the rocks as they are, not as what you're wanting them to be. Don't try to reshape them. Don't try to make them all look the same. This is what the Tower of Babel was, right? He, they made bricks all the same. The Bible specifically says that to build something, to, to try to get to heaven, and God says, we're not doing it that way. If you're gonna build an altar, it's gonna be all the stones, all of the experiences, all of the pains, all the jaggeds, all the, all the essences, all the little things about this person and their life means something. It's building up a holy place where my presence can dwell. And can I tell you today, you're custom made and everything that you've experienced and all the way that you're, ways that you're wired and all the ways that you think and the ways that you see the world and the way that the things that you've gone through all matter because it now creates the you that God says, I want to make this into an altar where my presence dwells. Your faith is unique. Your experience is unique. Your gifts are unique. You are unique. So the Bible talks about this all the time. Different gifts, different gifts, different gifts. Romans chapter 12 1 Corinthians chapter 12, Ephesians chapter four, 1 Peter chapter four. All of these lists, gifts, there's four places in the Bible where the, the gifts and these, these unique attributes of the believers are listed. But here's the deal. Not one of them is the same. They're not the same. Can you believe that? Like you gave us four different lists and they're all different. Why? Because these aren't exhaustive. They're just examples. It's not like, oh, I have to fit into tw one of these 24 different gifts. no. These are just examples of how it can be. He can spend all day talking. There's no way that we can spend a whole Bible talking about how you're specifically made. So he gives examples. Is that okay? Does that make sense? You're made so unique and so wonderfully. So watch this, Romans chapter 12 and four. To think with a sober judgment, each according to the measure of faith that God has assigned. For as in one body, we have many members and the members do not all have the same function. So we, though many, are one body in Christ and individually members of one another. So we belong to each other, okay? And he's like talking about a body. So like there's a finger and the finger does things that fingers do and the ears do things that ears do and the mouth is like, I wanna talk, I wanna talk. And the ear's like, no, no, we should listen. No. And the finger's like, no, we should point and reach and touch. And, and the heart's like, no, we should beat and feel and feel and feel. And you go, well, the heart drives me nuts. The mouth drives me nuts. Why? Because you're not a mouth. And you have a little small heart. No, I'm just kidding. You have a big heart. You have a big heart. But you're made so unique and specific. And so then he goes through this and he says, he says, having gifts that differ according to the grace given to us. So your gift and your grace are interconnected. I'm gonna tell you, if you wanna walk in the, the highest level of grace, walk in your gift. And if you find your grace and you find your gift, and you find your gift, you find your grace because they're, they're indelibly connected according to the grace given to us. Watch this. Let us then, uh, let us use them if prophecy in proportion to our faith, if service um, in serving. And the one who teaches in his teaching, the one who exhorts in his exhortation, and the one who contributes to generosity, the one who leads in zeal, the one who does acts of mercy, do it cheerful. Now, I'm gonna show you what Bill Gother, in an illustration, he said, I'm gonna show you how these work. Now, again, these aren't like 
they're more descriptive than prescriptive. Like you don't have to fall into one of these, but it's showing you of this list what it would look like in real time. So he says, imagine a waitress, a waitress or a waiter, a server is coming out with dessert. It's time to eat dessert. Brownies for, for everybody. No crust, all centerpieces. Everyone's getting their brownie. <laughs> and here they are walking. And, and he says, what if they trip and the dessert is everywhere? So he says, what are the seven responses of these seven characters and giftings in these seven people who are at the table where the dessert falls. And this is what he says. The person with the gift of prophecy would say, that's what happens when you're not careful. <laughs> that's why a lot of us are like, oh, those prophets, those prophets. But their motivation is to convict people of what they did wrong, to let them know something was wrong. The person with the gift of serving might say, hey, how can I help you clean this up? That person's desire is to meet a practical need. The person with the gift of teaching would say, the reason the tray fell is you put too many things on one side and needs to be balanced and more careful, be more carefully, uh, be more careful. Um, and that person wants clarity of truth. The person with the gift of exhortation would say, next time we can serve dessert with the meal. That person uh, has a practical solution for problems. The person with the gift of giving would say, I'll buy new dessert. Don't worry about it. I got new dessert forever. Everybody gets new dessert. French fries from Chick-fil-A on Sundays. Everybody gets them, okay? And then the person with the gift of mercy would respond by hugging the hostess and saying, it's okay. Don't feel bad. It could happen to anyone. That person doesn't care about the dessert. Doesn't even care about the people at the table. Only cares about empathizing with the person who's in distress the gift of mercy. And the person with the gift of leading would respond to the spilled dessert by saying, Bob, Janet, Rick, everybody get some towels. Get to the table. Mary, grab a mop for the floor. Jane, help fix the dessert. That are, and, and would give instructions. So you got the leading, mercy, giving, exhortation, teaching, serving, prophecy. And they all have their own way of helping. Does that make sense? So the key is, is that you have a certain way that you react to things. You have a certain way that you're bent, a certain eye for things, the way that you see certain things. And let me tell you, God loves that and God wants to use that. God doesn't need you to be me or me to be you or you to be somebody else or like somebody else. God wants to use your resources, your insights, your gifting. If you give it to him, it becomes holy. If you use it for his glory, it becomes holy. And let me give you a little secret. The Bible teaches us that when we serve one another, we become a body. And when we become a body, then the body can serve the world. The, the body of Christ can never make an impact if it's disjointed, disunified. Does, the, the finger thinks it's a, a mouth. The mouth is acting like an ear. The leg is trying to act like, like an armpit. I don't know why I said armpit, but that's the only one that came to me. We're, we're all messed up. But when we know who we are and we walk in it, and we walk in that gift of faith and that gift of grace, it changes everything. Administering grace of God in various forms. First Peter 4 and 10. Each of you should use whatever gift you have received to serve others as faithful stewards of God's grace in various forms. Amen? So, I'm really interested in you. I'm interested in who you are, what you're called to be. I'm interested in you truly drawing close to God and paying attention to the spirit that wants to guide you and to call you and set you apart for you to make a difference. It can be in the church, through the church. Maybe your, your, your ministry is, is something that, that is, that, that through, the, through, the, through the, the gifts of the church, us helping you to go do something that, that is so outside the box. I love outside the box stuff. God wants to use you for his glory. So it says, each of you should use whatever gift you have received to serve others as faithful stewards of God's grace in various forms. Now, why is this important? In 2007, there were 450 fatalities with American commercial airlines. That's a lot. And what they tell us is, well, it's still safer than driving. And I know that, but when I get on that plane and I'm on that runway and they're doing safety demonstrations of what to do if we're in the water and what to do if that, and you're just like, this doesn't feel safer than a vehicle. 
But the truth is, is you're more likely to get an accident on the way to the airport than in an airplane, a commercial airplane. So you go, okay, I, 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 can, I can buy into that. But the truth is, is that there have been accidents and they get reported and you're like, man. But something unique happened in 2007, eight and nine, something happened that changed the industry forever. In fact, the last commercial, uh, United States commercial airline for an accident was Colgan Air Flight 3407. It crashed near Buffalo, New York in 2009. Since then, things have changed dramatically, and I'm gonna tell you why. First, I'm gonna tell you why, and then what it is. It changed because after this, they said, you know what? One of the reasons we're not doing good at safety, we're, we're great, but not, not doing as good as we can is because there's psychological ramifications for confessing the problem, admitting we were part of it. So they wanted to create a psychologically safe, career safe environment where you could say, hey, I think we messed up on that when we were working on it. Hey, I think that this is in the wrong place. Hey, we had a near miss in the air. In the air. And so here's what happened. The FAA, the Pilot Labor Union, Aircraft Mechanic Union, and the airlines, all four came together and said, we will disclose anything. And when we disclose it, no one's gonna be in trouble. And since 2009, there has not been one airline accident since they all said, we know what we're good at, but we've got to communicate and work together for the common purpose. Is that kind of profound to you? Not one, actually there is one person that that was two years ago, Southwest Airline, engine blows and someone was sucked out. But besides that, It would have been a flawless point, but it was one. <laughs> 19 billion passengers without an incident, minus one. Why? Because they knew what they were good at. The pilot would go, hey, we almost, had a, we, we almost uh, collided in the air on the takeoff, da, da, da. and the, the, the mechanic could say, well, what were you doing? Well, I was looking down at this. I had to hit this button. Well, we'll move this button up. So you could be looking, but also hit that. Okay, this helps communication. All of a sudden, it changed the industry completely. And my prayer is that the body of Christ can operate the same way. That the evangelists and the prayer team and those who love to teach and those who love to lead, those who have compassion, those who have a heart for injustice, those who have a heart for inner, our inner city, those, those who have a heart for um, you know, those the marriages that are broke, like all of us can work together in step to see families and lives transform to the glory of God. Amen? And the only way we're gonna do that, only way we're gonna see it is to know our place and to be fitly joined together. Now, let me go through this real quick and... and uh, I'm gonna be as, as, as quick as I can. I'm gonna show you this. This is called shape. It's spiritual gift, heart, ability, personality, and experience. Our original intent was to send out a text to everybody so you can take the shape test at two o'clock. But then, as I saw some jerseys, and we remembered the game today at 12.30, we decided to send it out at four o'clock. So if we have your information, you're gonna be getting this, this shape test to, Look into your spiritual gifts. Now, you're not gonna take this test. It's like taking a marriage test and thinking, oh, I'm gonna figure it all out and want, you're, it's not gonna work that way. But it's the beginning of waking something up inside of you, a conversation in your heart with God about how you're wired, how you're made, and figuring out, what do I have? Why do I feel this way about certain things? And, and, and how can this help me to help other people to serve, to make a difference? So let's talk about spiritual gifts really quickly. I'm gonna go through these really quickly. Spiritual gifts. This is the God-given ability. This is the stuff that comes easy. This is the stuff that God's put on you. It's like it opens doors. It's like, it's like there's a grace in it. You know, there's certain things you try and there's like no grace. It's like <clears throat> fingernails on a chalkboard. And there's other stuff that you do and you're, it's like, that was so easy. That was so fun. That was so awesome. You get a joy from it. There's a, there's a grace around it, right? Fresh desires around it. Or, or um, maybe an area that you found victory in. Maybe, maybe in your marriage you found victory. You went to a conference, went through a small group. And, and when Jesus found a victory, when he went into death and, got, and, and was victorious over death, the Bible says that he got the keys of death, hell and the grave. Now he has to share those with us. So when you have a victory in Christ, you get a key and now you can go, hey, we had a victory in our finances. I wanna help unlock a victory for you. We had a victory in our in our, in our 
relationship with, with family and in-laws, and, 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 and this has helped us. I wanna, I wanna start a small group and, and unlock that for other people. So the gifting may be connected to a victory or a gift that's been given by God. It's for you to discern like what is living inside of me that would be easy for me to just give to God. Okay, you're a, you're a workout person. We know who you are. You worship and you flex at the same time. It's powerful. You're, you're, you're pressing the devil. You're like, guta, take that, you know. But how can you use that to, to help the body of Christ, to, to, to inspire people who are outside of Christ, to come to Christ? Like, like the, the creative, all the creative ways to use your spiritual gift. Number two is heart. I like this question. What breaks your heart? What's a point of passion for you? What moves you? It moves you in a way where you have deep empathy for this sector or for this, this group or for this person or for this thing. And it like moves you like, why can't it be different? It's like Nehemiah, he hears about Jerusalem and how the, the walls aren't built. And now the enemies are coming against Jerusalem and they're trying to rebuild it. And he's, he's done even, he doesn't even live in Jerusalem, but he hears about it and the Bible says he wept. So what makes you weep? What breaks your heart? And he goes and he helps uh, Ezra and that crew build the wall, build back um, Jerusalem. Long story short, there's something in you that moves your heart. You watch a video and you're like, you just, you can't hold it back. You hear a testimony, you're like, Ugh. you hear another testimony, you're like, that's, you get a golf clap. But you hear something about freedom or who knows what it may be. It keeps coming up and you go, it just hits your heart. That is the question. What's the, what's the quiver in your liver? That's the question. Philippians 2 and 19. If the Lord Jesus is willing, I hope to send Timothy to, uh, to you soon for a visit. Then he can cheer you up by telling me, uh, sorry, cheer me up by telling me um, how you're getting along. I have no one else like Timothy, watch this, who genuinely cares about your welfare. I'm not sending you Timothy because he can put the hat on to be the pastor, because he likes being pastor, like he loves you. He'll figure out how to be the pastor, but he loves you. He genuinely has a heart for you. Number three is ability. Your abilities create opportunities. Again, the muscle guy, uh, Lauren London, who uh, is leading a team outside with the parking, Laura London has been on television before, had her own show. She owns a business. She, she's, she's, she's got a, the leader instinct. She didn't go to parking school. But she goes, I have a leadership thing. I just wanna, we're gonna help this thing because it drove me crazy. I'm sure it drives other people crazy. We're gonna figure this out. Can we give Laura London a hand? It's an ability. I'm giving you the ability, right? It's like the little, little, little kid who gets the ball. He's in the backyard and he, throws the ball up and he, he misses. Gets the ball, throws it again, misses. Throws it up again, misses. His parents are watching and he starts shouting. He's all excited. And his parents come out and go, what's, what's going on? He goes, man, I'm a good pitcher. I'm a good pitcher. Abilities. <laughs> Ability is also we gotta think about availability, like ability and availability. You know, what's right in front of you? What is, where has God planted you? What, a, a cool story, and I don't have time to tell it, is the story of Darren Sim, who um, became Joseph Prince from Singapore's number two guy who runs the whole ministry. Well, Joseph Prince is, is in church like this, and the Lord says, that's gonna be your, your guy, you're, gonna, you're number two right there. He goes up to him and goes, Hey, you're supposed to run my ministry, Jesus, Jesus told me. He goes, I've never ran a ministry. I think I'm, a, I mean, I'm, I'm unemployed right now. I don't, I don't have any skills. And he goes, but you will, but you're gonna figure it out. And he stepped into it and helped develop this ministry. And the reason I know this story personally was because a good friend of mine is good friends with him. And so long story short, I just think that there are opportunities that will pull out abilities that you don't even realize that you have. Like sometimes the coolest thing that you can do is say yes. Ezekiel, um, excuse me, um, in, in the book of Corinthians, 1 Corinthians 16 and nine says this, there's a wide open door for a great work here, although many oppose me, okay? Number four is personality, okay? There's some people who light up a room when they walk in and there's some people who walk, light up a room when they walk out, <laughs> right? Am I right? Sayonara. Um, 
Personality matters. Some people, that, they, 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 want, they need to be on the computer. They're on a spreadsheet. Them and the spreadsheet have a great relationship. Don't put them on a phone answering questions about stuff. They will, they will knock you to next Tuesday. They don't care, right? I don't, um, Paul was a guy who made people bleed for what they believe. But then God knew his personality and said, I know you will bleed for what you believe. And he became a great church planter. Ezekiel passes by and sees dead bones. He sees something. It's in his personality to stop and go, dead bones. God's like, you wanna speak to those dead bones? I don't know. And dead bones come alive. Personality matters. And then experience, experience. You have experiences that are so unique. They become fuel. They become points of passion. Jesus' greatest ministry came from his deepest pain. Things that you've gone through. Some of you have mileage on the odometer. You've done ministry before, but it's laying dormant. You've served before. You've been in small groups before, but it's laying dormant. But some of you have gone through some things. And one of my favorite passages, 2 Corinthians 1 and 4, he comforts us in all our troubles so that we can comfort others. You know what I wish the scripture said? He gets us out of all of our troubles so that we can never have to worry about it again. He comforted us. We went through some things. We experienced some things. And I know there's other people going through some things. Some of you have experienced great loss, great pain. You've been through seasons of loneliness. You've experienced things and now you know Jesus and he's like, this is, a, this is an edge on your stone, but this belongs somewhere. This fits somewhere. This is gonna help. I wanna anoint this and turn this into an altar. Like, I want you to know our heart is not for you to get saved and become the frozen chosen who just sit and wait for Jesus to come back. You've been called to be deployed into kingdom work to live at a higher calling, to know God, find freedom, and discover your purpose and go make a difference and change lives. Amen? Do you want that? Does this resonate with your heart? I love that. Just, there is more. There's more. There's more that God has. Would you bow your heads and close your eyes? I want to pray for us. Heavenly Father, I pray for every person in this room and those online. I am so grateful for every soul that you washed and saved through the blood of Jesus. But you've redeemed us for a purpose. There's people in this room right here who have so much significance tucked into their life. And it doesn't have to be sensational to be significant. It doesn't have to be millions, billions. And it, sometimes the significance is one touch, one word, one moment that changes the trajectory of someone's life forever. I pray, Lord, that you would awaken our church, awaken our hearts, make it clear in Jesus' name. What on earth am I here for? I find it in you. And everybody say, amen. Come on, can we clap our hands to heaven? Amen. Now, before you go, before you go, there's, there's another group of people that are in this room that I wanna address really quickly. You may be here and you may go, I, this all sounds great, but where do I start? I don't even know that I have a relationship with God. I, I feel fear. I have doubt. I, you know, I, feel guilt and shame for what I've done and what I've not done. And here I am listening to a sermon from a preacher at a church. And, and here's all I want to say. God does not run away from runaways. He is so close. It's going to blow your mind. If you will call out to God and invite him into your life and just say, I'm giving you permission. I don't know all the steps. I don't know what tomorrow holds, but I know you hold tomorrow in your hands. If you will, if, if you'll just take that posture, just say, I surrender to you, God. Come into my life. What Jesus did 2,000 years ago, paid a debt that he did not owe because I owed a debt that I could not pay, the debt of my sin. 
I want to receive that. I want to, I want to accept that. I want to make that a reality in my life. I want to live like I'm forgiven. I want to live like I'm loved. I want to live like I have purpose. I want to, I want to, I want to believe today for the first time that there's someone who knows me, cares about me unconditionally. If that's you, will you just raise your hand? No one looking around. We'll just bow our heads, close our eyes. No one looking around. If, you, if, you're, if you're here today and you say, that, that's me, I, I want to make a fresh start with Jesus. Thank you so much. 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 Thank you. Four hands. Thank you. Four, five. Thank you. Here in the back. Thank you in front. Six. Thank you for raising your hand. Thank you. Come on. Six souls today that are saying yes to Jesus. The best thing that you could ever do. I know who you are. Thank you for raising your hands. Thank you. I want to pray with you. The church wants to pray with you. Just open your heart. Heavenly Father, I believe that you care for me, that you made me. I'm here on purpose. I believe that I'm here today on purpose. I believe that today I'm gonna be changed because I'm gonna say yes to Jesus. I don't know what all that entails. All I know is that within my own strength and power, there's so much disparity and pain and fear, emptiness. But Lord, fill me with your spirit. Make me alive. Heal my heart. Heal my relationships. Heal my life. I need a fresh start with God. Today I say yes. Today I surrender my all. I just say yes. I surrender. I'm putting the white flag up and just saying I surrender. I surrender. I surrender. Forgive me. Heal me. Heal my marriage. Heal my my family. Heal my relationships. Heal my heart. Heal my mind. Come into my life. Make me new. In Jesus' name. Come on, say it with me, in Jesus' name. I believe it, I receive it. I'll never be the same in the church. Say amen, 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 amen. Hey, if, you, if you're one of those six, seven people that raised your hands, we have a book for you, and I wanna get this into your hand. We have a team that's in the back. Make sure not to leave without getting this book, a fresh start book. We'd love to meet you really quickly. Get this book into your hands. It's a gift from us to you. We love you guys. Would you stand? We also have our prayer team. Everybody say Everybody say, hello, prayer team. Man, these are amazing people that would love to partner with you, whatever need you have, partner with your faith. So if you have a need in your life, feel free to come forward. Also, next steps and groups, a lot of things happening out in the Connect Center. We love you guys. See you next week for part three of What on Earth Am I Here For?